This is Empowering Homeschool Conversations. We want families to come here and gain insightful strategies that empower them to successfully teach diverse learners at home. Hosted by founder and CEO of Sped Homeschool, Peggy Ployer. Our goal is that these powerful weekly conversations will boost your confidence to cultivate the best at-home learning environment for your student. For more homeschool resources, go to spedhomeschool.com. You're listening to Empowering Homeschool Conversations with Peggy Ployer. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Empowering Homeschool Conversations. Today, we are going to talk about homeschool curriculum customization methods. And actually, we're going to take you through with my guest today, Andrew Fan, um, co-founder of The Vocal Gym. We're going to go step by step through a a methodology that he has um, developed on how you can actually customize your own curriculum step by step, how to do it. Um, And I know that that's just exciting in itself. Um, Andrew is a multi-talented creative expert holding degrees in music and film and television production. And after a decade as a producer and a travel and food journalist for the Sydney Morning Herald from his native home in Australia, he delved into publishing the publishing world, co-editing Amazon's best-selling book, The Seven Dimensions of Singing. Andrew has also dedicated the last five years of to studying unique learning techniques with a focus on ADHD-informed pe- pe- pediology, <laughs> um, only after recently discovering ADHD um, his own ADHD as an adult. He brings um, his specialized expertise to this role as co-founder of the Vocal Gym for Homeschool, a revolutionary online program that offers individualized ADHD-friendly vocal training. The course is lauded for its patented methodology and provides an affordable, effective alternative to traditional voice lessons. Welcome, Andrew. I am so excited to have you on the show today. <laughs> Thanks, Peggy. And what an introduction you gave me. You know, like, ah. you <laughs> that's quite a lot. Thank it, you it's so a mouthful much. for sure. And <laughs> it shows I didn't read it ahead of time. And I just, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that happens, you know, you're live. <laughs> what can you do? We're doing it live. <laughs> exactly. And so if you're joining us live, um, we are broadcasting for the first time new on Instagram. So super excited about that. Um, but just know that you can put your comments, your questions in the feed, wherever you're watching from, whether you're watching from Twitter, um, Let's see, YouTube, Facebook. I know there's a couple other ones in there, Um, but we would like you to be part of this conversation. If there's some specific um, curriculum woes that you're going through with homeschooling and you want to know, how do I customize that? Um, Throw it in the comments. Um, We would love to um, address those specifically at the end of the conversation. Um, We do have one um, question that was submitted ahead of time uh, by one of our um, subscribers to to our email. So just know that in upcoming episodes, if you look on what um, we're going to be talking about, you can also do it that way if you can't join us live. So, um, so Andrea, I just love when I start out my show to ask um, my, my guests just to tell a little bit about themselves, Uh, some, you know, just maybe something beyond your bio um, that would be interesting for our guests and to really give them an idea of why this, um, this topic specifically is important to you. Um, so I, you know, you saw the career history, but I think one of the big things for me early on was I, I kept jumping, you know, that was a, such a huge list. I kept jumping from one, uh, career choice to another. And yeah. after a while, um, friends would ask me like, why, why are you so sporadic <laughs> in your decision? And I, I, I kept racking my brain, kept thinking like, maybe I, it's because I'm a millennial you know, we, can't, we can't sit still. Um, but I, I kind of started to see a thread in all of the things. Firstly, um, that, you know, I was, I, I actually was a performance major. I was a singer on stage and that's how I met Richard. And when we both, uh, co-founded the vocal gym, yeah. um, and then moving from there, I, I moved into management and I became a photojournalist and then it's like sound and picture. So then I went to film school. But like there was a big thing for me and uh, it kind of all came together in this conversation of I'm very big on story. I find that when we understand story, the structure of it, how it works, who we are as people, how we think, all of it really leads back to story. 
Um, yes. Story is the one tool that we can. It's kind of like the vessel for change. It's like it's yeah. the, the thing that helps us without having to live that experience ourselves when we can connect and relate it leads to us growing and changing. So I was so fascinated by that structure. And then everything that I did, I always tied back to the fundamental question, which is the why. Why do mm. we do things this way? Why do yeah. we think this way? What made us change our minds? And it all fundamentally led back to why. So um, yeah, all of that is, and then on top of that, um, what really hit this whole thing off was discovering I had ADHD. Yeah. 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 That's a game changer when you, you kind of realize that what, what ha is happening behind the scenes with what's causing you to make decisions and do things the way you do. I know I have a um, EDS, which is uh, an issue with my connective tissue and I can't sit still for very long. And I kept going, am I just a nervous person? Why can't I sit in a chair? And my husband's like, why can't you ever sit still? You're always up and you're moving and you're sitting on your feet. And they're like, because if I sit still, it hurts, you know, and, but wow. that, that, um, that revelation like gave me freedom to, to go, oh yes, this is, it's not just me being quirky. <laughs> it's, it's something I do for survival almost. Um, and it's just the way I, you know, I just have to embrace it. And, um, and then you, you feel like, oh yeah, this, this feels right. So, so I totally get that, um, that understanding with, with, you know, have that diagnosis too. Oh, totally. I it's I think it's when you know you finally have the freedom to say it's okay and yeah. I can move forward. The first step is acknowledging that that's in existence and then mm -hmm. we can move from there. I think the challenge, and I, I'm sure parents at home with their kids as well, if they have learning differences or um, they might have ADHD like me, it's it's hard sometimes, particularly when it comes to certain brain disorders, to, to separate the sense of self and value and then yes. a disorder that you have to work around. So it's about building like really good tools and understanding the fundamental of someone maybe with a learning difference. And I, hopefully we can talk a little bit about those things as we move through the plan. Right. But yes. To really understand what makes uh, us tick uh, um, those who don't maybe have um uh, ADHD, and as well as how does an ADHD person's brain respond differently to stimuli, and then building a system around that to help teach. So, yeah, yeah, that's... yeah, absolutely. So Andrew has an amazing handout, and that we're going to kind of follow step by step through. So, and we're also going to work through a lesson plan um, that we just I got off the website from Matthew C. Um, it was a pretty standard math um, program, but he's going to show us how to even customize it even more and, and really how to teach your student, like you were just talking about, Andrew, you know, mm -hmm. those, those uh, tools, you know, we're, we're, you don't modify an, um, curriculum or customize it just to make it easier, but you do it to teach your student how to learn and how to right. learn in a way that works for them. And right. so so don't feel like you're just going, well, I have to, to change this. But no, Andrew's going to walk us through a process that you can teach your student how to better their learning experiences and their ability to learn. So I'm 100%. super excited about this. So we yes. um, the, the, the lesson that we can talk through is uh, one that will be attached with the handout. So that's great. Yeah. Um, it's the one that you sent me. But I'll also try to reference... Um, if it's not a math lesson, I also have how your voice works. One of the lessons we have on the local gym. Okay, and how we can awesome. Apply that That's too. great. Yeah. So, so let's let's jump really through can apply it. So to anything, with, right? Yeah. <laughs> so let's jump. Let's jump to number one. Okay. So this one goes without saying that understanding the learner's needs. So gauge the learner's strengths and challenges through discussion and tailor your teaching methods. Now, one yeah. of the big things with this particular point is understanding the student and the person as a whole, not just in the subject that we're talking about, like how do they right. learn, how do they think, and that's great, but what else are they interested in? Uh, do yes. we notice any patterns in the way that they're learning? Are there topics that they're particularly interested in? Is there anything that they're particularly focused on? And it's not just that, what resistances do they have? 
do they have right. a preference? Yeah, for the positives mode? and the minuses all mixed in there. Yeah, a hundred percent. And just looking at my notes here too, it's breaking the lesson down into those short kind of segments, particularly like if they have problem with paying attention for an extended period of time, right? Automatically take the lesson plan and see are there sectionable parts. So just mm, looking at the idea. lesson plan that we have, uh, which is the lesson eight that you have there, it's got division by six. And, mm -hmm. and when looking through there, you can see there are systematic systems, like there's a review part, there's a lesson practice, and there's um, little bits of examples as well. So maybe instead of allocating to do a complete lesson on their own, work in sections. So that's someone with, say, ADHD and they can't, hold attention, but I'll go into a little bit more detail about that. And the same with the link, if you look at how the voice works on the link at the bottom of the attachment, you can also see it's broken up into a video section. There's some diagrams and some reviews. So don't try to take the whole thing at once. So it's little bits of understanding, particularly your person, uh, looking at them as a whole. So a uh, complete, complete and comprehensive profile. So um, yeah, Peggy, that's, yeah. that's what, yep. what are your thoughts? Um, you know, it, we, we talk a lot about this in our, in, in past episodes, but, but I think you, you, it's so nice to hear that, you know, this is the child in the lesson plan have to kind of mesh. And we often just look at the child without the perspective of the lesson plan. And so I love that you brought both of those together. But um, but that's perfect, because I think we often try to just say, okay, so my child learns like this, and they have these things, but now I still have to stuff them into <laughs> this right. lesson that was given to me. Um, and um, Andrew just gave you the freedom not to do that. So yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I remember us, us talking about that earlier, too, about how a just because someone designed a curriculum a certain way yeah. does not mean that that is the best way for your child to learn it absolutely it, and and it's also uh the second oh we, i remember now that really big point of if if for example uh, like traditional education uh, encourage us encourages us to have good structure or be set in our ways that we do things and that's a skill and a trait we want to inculcate in our children and our students as well. But if you're trying to help them learn math at the same time, it's kind of choosing which is the priority in that particular moment. So effectively not dividing um, what it is and the focus you're achieving in the lesson that you have and maybe saving how to learn at a different time than when you're trying to learn math, for example. Exactly. Yes. One, one thing at a time sometimes. <laughs> cool. So we'll jump, we'll jump to the so next yeah, one. So the next, um, the number two. <laughs> this is, this is a, a big one for me. Uh, this one, um, I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this point and this is a really, really good point to take into account. So in particular with, uh, with ADHD, um, in general, our, um, people with ADHD have an either an undersupply or an underutilization of dopamine. So dopamine is one of a few transmitters, a neurotransmitters in the brain. So imagine them as uh, cars traveling down the highway with actions. So hmm. they, they drive down the highway with actions. Um, and we either, the vehicle for dopamine, so there's a few, there's serotonin, which controls, you know, euphoric happiness. There's, right. um, um, norepinephrine, which is the fight or flight when we're under stress. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a few others, but dopamine is the one that makes you feel accomplished, a job well done, mm. hard work. You know, we enjoy hard work. So people with ADHD either underutilize it or underproduce it. So oftentimes we don't feel the high or the satisfaction from completing work that lots uh -huh. of other people do. So uh, and, and that's mainly from the part of our brain that controls executive front function in the front here. So executive function mm -hmm. is when me as a person, Andrew as a person says, I want to do this, but the rest of my body won't respond using mm -hmm. the dopamine path. So that's why oftentimes you see kids with ADHD, they forget things or they uh, can't focus on one thing, even though internally they want to do it. 
the frustration right. of that is incredibly challenging. So although we want to work on developing the dopamine usage, and there are so many medical things you can do, and that's up to every parent to do the research on that as well. But one of the tools that I found um, specifically effective for myself is using some of those other pathways. So uh, norepinephrine creates the fight or flight response, and oftentimes we rely on that. Um, but there are three key things that I know will help motivate me in particular, and this applies quite broadly. So yeah. that's incorporating challenge, novelty, mm. and urgency. So those three things are challenge, novelty, and urgency, and I'll go through each of those. So yeah. challenge is if someone says to me, hey, Andrew, I don't think you can run a marathon. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and you know what? Realistically, let's, let's, that's a little bit of a crazy, crazy illustration. But, you know, if, if, if the challenge was big enough and I really wanted to run a marathon, amazing. Like, I, huh. I, that would be a trigger for me to start training. Number two, number two is novelty. Is the concept or activity stimulating enough for my brain that it will yeah. say, Andrew, you, you want to go do that. That looks like so much fun. Right. That will also make me go and do things. But number three, the one I commonly use is urgency. Hmm. Now, urgency is when uh, I, I know this for sure. So going through college and also as a journalist, I would go on a two week uh, travel writing trip and I would come yeah. back and I would sit in front of a blank blinker to start the article, <laughs> but I couldn't write until the day before. Wow. So in mm -hmm. this situation, yeah, it's terrible. That's really <laughs> terrible. So stressful too. But right. I would somehow the day before, and a lot of kids do this too with their assignments, they just get done the day, the night before. And sometimes they do really well and, and, other, and some can cope and others really struggle because mm -hmm. it's creating that urgency. And one of the big things that I like to do is to make sure that my triggers for things to get done is outside of my own internal decision making. Oh. So that's a big one. So if there is a clock or a time or a podcast we have this afternoon, right? it, it will make sure that it will trigger me. So example, mm. so if we're working on the math lesson right um could if we talk outside of the lesson plan and just about planning your lesson for the day are there stimuli that you could use to trigger challenge novelty or urgency so if you complete <laughs> these questions accurately with a certain accuracy in under 20 minutes there you it will reveal the next fun activity your child may respond mm, okay. to good story and movement so that might trigger excitement it triggers and the more you can hit the better if it's challenge novelty oh, and yeah. urgency yeah so if it's a novel idea if there is a mystery box over there with what mm. you might be having for lunch or a snack but you have you can access that box only if you succeed within this time so Got sometimes it. people might feel that as pressure but it's more just a taking the responsibility of decision making away from the executive function that isn't functioning to the best oh, of its ability. Oh, that's fascinating. Yes. So um, there are lots of really cool things too. Um, I've got one of these. I don't know if people can see them, but it's a wonderful little timer that has numbers on the side. So it has 5, 3, 24. Actually, I'll talk about that in another section, but it helps keep time in a certain way and, and we'll go on. But it's really right. understanding what kind of challenges your student or child might respond to a challenge right. to um you know that will stimulate them and make them move forward um are they what is their interest that they're tied to like if they're into sports how can you attach uh your quiz to like there are five players on it on, on a basketball team right or and yes. there's a six man on the bench like using things that they're already interested in and adapting that to the lesson I think mm -hmm. what we talked about is the onus sometimes of, yeah, it's um, teaching and homeschooling is hard. Being a teacher is a lot harder than people give it credit for. And if right. we really want to be effective, 
you know, we have to really cater to the way that our students learn. So that's a yeah, good little tip. No, I, I love that because some of this, you know, like you talked about, you could take the lesson and incorporate those those interests, that novelty as as part of the lesson. But then some of it is just outside ad. Um, so the, the, the mystery box, you know, all those things, those could be just tools you have at the ready. Um, mm -hmm. just when you break apart that lesson too. So, so, so things on both sides. So really easily adaptable for, I'm, for yeah. multiple different lesson type of scenarios, which is wonderful because parents need a lot of good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> right, totally. All right. Let's, so, let's jump to the next one. Yeah. Yeah, so the next one, segment lessons and managing time. This one's great. So science-wise, um, our brain uses those little vehicles I was telling you, the neurotransmitters, to make us do things. That includes like moving our hands and arms, um, uh, executive function, making us happy. Now, there is only enough to run for 50 minutes straight for dopamine. Or, wow. and so, so after 50 minutes your brain's ability is diminished um, exponentially as you come down, if you continuously push something. So is that 15 or 50, did 50, you say? 50. 50. So if, you, if you go the full 50, then you have to have a minimum of 10 minutes of completely something else that isn't using that part of the brain. And physical exercise often helps speed that process up. Yeah. What is recommended is actually if you can even better is if you can do 25 minutes and five minute breaks. So you're not fully running out of everything. Um, but when you get to 50, your uh, returns uh, on learning and absorbing information pretty much go down. So yeah. is you, that you should... is that pretty much across the board for mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've Everyone. heard in the past is like for younger children, it's even shorter, but it well, at, um, yeah, I'm sure it is for as your brain's developing. But for the average human, I think from teenagers mm -hmm. on and particularly people okay. with ADHD, this is really important. But yeah, 50 minutes, yeah. 50 and 10 or 25 and 5. OK, so yeah. and that's what I was saying to you earlier. Um, and we'll talk about it in technology in a second. This is a really simple tool for somebody with ADHD, for example. Yeah, I'm um, going to remove has, this slide just so we get a bigger view of yeah, you. Yeah, see if you can do that. that. If you, it's got numbers on the... If I, see if I can make yeah, I think when you pushed it, it lit up too or let's something. Make it light up. So I'm going to put it on... Hold on, let me see if I can put it on the table and start the timer. So it's blinking. Oh, I can't make it light up now. But basically, you just have to put it down on the face oh. of the number. And okay. it is the allocated time. So if you've got 25 oh, minute that's lesson, cool. yes. put the timer down mm -hmm. on 25. You can easily just jump on Amazon. It'll start <laughs> beeping and then <laughs> off you go. So oh, cool. everything from five minute break to 25 minutes, it's 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 novel, it's fun enough, and it's right. really simple to do. And it takes the pressure off of mom saying, oh, it's time yeah. to get back to that table. No, the buzzers are going off, so it's time to go back. <laughs> and it's kind of like when we talk about structure, um, one of the things about homeschooling, of course, gives us so much flexibility in education. Right. But one of the great things about school is the regiment of this is when the bell goes. Mm -hmm. And that's when we we jump to the next class. Like no matter where right. you're at, stop kind of thing. So 25 and 5 and then mm -hmm. 50 and 10. So look at yeah. your lesson plan. Um, um, my suggestion, as always, is observe, observe, observe. Look yeah, at previous lessons. Great idea. How long mm -hmm. did it take them to go through certain sections? And then how long does it take them to absorb information? One yeah. of the great things, even though uh, kids without learning differences that do utilize dopamine, is the feeling of success. If we compartmentalize the tasks and exercises down to something they can easily complete in that limit, it's the yeah. joy of, I did good, as right. opposed to, I failed. Yeah. And I, and and you don't want to ever end on that because that just oh, makes getting started again so much harder. <laughs> it's such a repeating cycle um, yes. over and yeah. over again. So mm -hmm. definitely yeah. organize your lesson in segments of either 25 with a five minute physical activity break or 50 and 10. Okay. And that gives enough time for reuptake to happen for the neurotransmitters to get themselves yeah. going again. Awesome. 
Cool. And so, yeah, number no, four. Number four. Okay, so here are some ideas to incorporate different ways of learning. Now, there is a little bit of a myth of people saying that, oh, I'm a visual learner and I'm a sound learner. They actually did a study and found that we utilize them all. Right. Um, and there isn't any one that we're stronger towards, but hmm. it doesn't mean we can't utilize different stimuli. So, for example, my when we are having a conversation with someone, we're listening to them talk, we're watching their body language, we're hearing changes in pitch for tone, we're absorbing information and learning how somebody is and the society around us, not just by the words that they're saying. Right. So, so, so much a, context that comes with that. So, yeah. so much context. <laughs> yeah. And the more context you present, the, the better it will be for the brain to absorb it. One of the exercises... Right they have when you're trying to learn a new language, for example, is to keep tipping a balloon in the air. And every huh. time you make contact with the word, you recite the word in the new language. What that's doing is it's using uh, motor parts of your brain to uh, reinforce, oh, that's what they're learning at the same time. So the same works okay. with context. So when we do illustrations, we're presenting an imaginary image that people can see. And then if we incorporate other activities in, particularly hmm. something someone's having a challenge with, it right. takes away the mundaneness of it. it. It stimulates other parts of the brain to connect that all together. So if there's particular lessons that are a struggle, if they struggle with numbers and math, how can we use physical objects and incorporate right. that into the lesson? Mm -hmm. How can we incorporate sound into the lesson? Like how many yes. beeps did you hear? Or there are three birds or there's lots of ways that we can specifically uh, do that. So using multiple senses uh, in density, plus also yeah. what, what kids see these days in videos and on TikTok and all of their content, they're used to absorbing masses of cont contextual information yes. at one time. So mm -hmm. use multi-sensory approach. Yes. Yeah. Don't just stick to one and say, oh, good. We checked that box off. But like Andrew is saying, you know, pile it on using that that multi um, sensory approach. And because you just never know what is going to trigger that that connection in the brain to say, I'm going to anchor this one here because I remember yes. something related to who knows what. And mm -hmm. it's going to trigger that memory and cause that um, the long term um, storage better. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, cool. Yeah. So that's All that right. One. So so next one, engage number five interactively. interactively. Okay. Yes. So um, find different ways to have discussions, group activities, problem solving. But yeah. one of the fascinating things is like we talked about in point one. So if your child or student say loves uh, Minecraft or Roblox, that's what the kids are playing. Oh like, yeah. How, like, if you took the time to take personal interest and know, do you know how to go in there and create a little mini world that requires some math? Did you, like, we, the lesson is on divide by six. What if you ask them to build buildings in scales of six? Oh. Like, there's lots good. of ways that we can right. use interaction and those things. Um, just a quick note on a really good idea is to sit down and mind map. What do I know about my yes. child? Like draw a bunch of different circles. They love this. They love this. And then mm -hmm. find a way to connect those dots. How can I incorp incorporate a math lesson into Roblox? Mm -hmm. How can I incorporate something else into something else they're into? Or they right. have this regular friend that comes over. How can I give them an adventure or some kind of project that takes the application of those lessons? take oh, the lesson off nice. the page yeah right um, oh absolutely yes and i think that's such a like a really great way to like teach like and mm -hmm. as i think as a student wow i'm allowed to like hey guys i'm allowed to play roblox during this for like 20 minutes like there's a, a world there that i can build like that's that's amazing and I, mm -hmm. I i think just the mindfulness in the way that we prepare our lessons is Absolutely. Kind of yes. Well, and it, it teaches your student too that learning is not boring. And plus, it, it's something you can apply in every 
aspect of life instead of just, well, it's one of those books we take out and we do school and then you put it away and then the rest of life happens. It's not, I mean, as we get older, we, we learn, we, we learn to, to, to feed ourselves, um, mm -hmm. our brain and also to interact with others. And, and so, so yes, the, the younger and sooner you can do that and make it fun and applicable, the, the more your student is going to want to engage in those things later on in life too. And I found the same true for my kids, you know, they're always learning because we made it part of life. I, I think also as a parent, well, I'm not personally a parent, but it's also going to build your relationship too. Like yes. how understanding mm -hmm. your child and communicating and you are going to learn so much by you being a more effective teacher too. just learn about yourself. Right. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? How can I be a better teacher? How can I be a better parent? And I think yeah. it's just such, I mean, the feeling that someone tailored something specifically for you, knows how you think, knows how you feel, what's going to frustrate you, and has done the best that they could to take care of you like that. I think that's something yeah. you will remember for the rest of your life as you're growing up too. Absolutely. I love how you you turned that because a lot of parents will say, but you know, I'm, I'm putting these, you know, making it too easy for them, you know, and I'm like, no, listen to Andrew, you're not making it too easy. You are making it, you're making it show that you love your, your, your child and that they're important and what they they're interested in is important and how they learn is important. I think what you just said there hits it on the head too, of do you want them to learn the math lesson or do you want them to learn the math lesson the way you want to teach it? And that's, yeah. that's the big thing. I like, I only want to teach this way. I want them to learn this way. And if they don't, it's their fault for not studying hard enough. Mm -hmm. And that's such a challenge. It's like choosing the right time. Like we talked about earlier, choosing the right, right time for the right lesson. Yes. Yeah. We want them to be able to process information on their own independently, but is it effective? And if you try to do that while you're trying to help them learn something specifically. Oh, I remember we had a conversation yeah. earlier, Peggy, about if someone has social anxiety and you're trying to. Oh, yes. Yeah. Do you want to talk? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I, it, it comes up often because I think a lot of people within our community, they remove their kids from a school setting because their child has social um, issues. They, you know, just anxiety issues. And so in, being in a school environment causes a lot of issues. My oldest, that's why we didn't, we started homeschooling because um, he was diagnosed with autism and he couldn't keep it together in a classroom. Um, but then it seems like we, we lose this perspective really quick and we tried to join a co-op and, and all these other things. And I learned very quickly, this is not a good environment for my child to learn in overall. Um, he needs to learn one-on-one -on -one and to have it customized, build a lot with his hands. And when we started applying that, he realized how intelligent and smart he was. But then we, we picked and chose those social environments where we would engage and work on only that engagement <laughs> as something he learned. So it was something of interest to him that we would go to, and then it made it easier. So it was all replying all these things that Andrew's talking about. But I think too often we just say, oh, well, we're homeschooling now, so let's do the homeschool thing. And you forget so quickly that you're just trying to replicate what you left that didn't work. So, right. so think very carefully. Yes. About uh, which that. leads us to number six, actually, if you jump to the next yeah. one. Mm -hmm. Minimize distractions, reduce resistance. Yes. So uh, one of the big things for people with ADHD and particularly myself is separation of tasks by category. So I'll give you an example. I used to work from a home office a lot. I had my dedicated mm -hmm. space in my home office, which was fine. But it was so easy, like, oh, I want to go make a meal in the kitchen. I wonder what's happening out there. Or uh, I maybe I'll take a nap real quick and then I'll like <laughs> jump back to what I was doing. But what one of the big things is if we know somebody is easily distractible, and even if not, is the environment we're in free of distractions? Is right. the, is is their video game set within line of sight? Is the, is the, um, you know, like, are there things and alarms and triggers that will go off that you don't want them to? 
is it going right. to break their focus? Um, one of the big things, um, great book um, uh, to read, uh, and I'm sure a lot of um, people have read too, is the Atomic Habits book. And oh, it yeah. just talks about every day if we can just make it better by 1%. One hmm. single percent of just make it better. And so there's a great story in there about a cycling team that was underperforming, but the, the new coach came in and just maybe changed the uniforms from a more aerodynamic material, maybe changed right. the pillows they slept on to support them better. And hmm. they saw drastic change over time. So when we're looking at our school environment, are there distractions in the way that we're teaching in the curriculum? Yes. Are there distractions in the room, the writing surfaces? Uh, is, mm. Are the colours of the room distracting? Are there toys or things that will make uh, the student, particularly someone with ADHD, just suddenly go, oh, that looks <laughs> right. more novel. <laughs> uh -huh. That looks like it's more urgent or more fun for me to do. And it's about right. reducing that resistance and minimising that distraction. Yeah. Yeah. And too often we as parents, and I know I, I was guilty of this for a long time till I actually realized what, what was going on is, you know, I'd say, okay, I'm getting you started in this lesson. I'm going to go take care of a couple of things and I'll be back. And then I totally lose the child. It's like, no, this is dedicated teaching time. And I had to just get into my head that this is important that I keep them on task by being next to them. And that reduces the distraction because all of a sudden I'm doing the dishes or that. And then all of a sudden a child disappears and I don't even know where they went. <laughs> and um, I know this is a common problem because I totally. hear totally. Yeah. Um, and, one of the big yeah. ones, uh, particularly with ADHD, is they call it body doubling. Sometimes yeah. it's just another body in the room with them while they're doing the yeah. task makes them do the task. Sometimes they just need a body double. So if you do right. have another task that you have to do and you have to do it, try to do it within their space that someone else is there to keep the accountability external. Right. I don't have an excuse that they left me and therefore I have this window. Yeah. And again, nothing about this is easy. Parenting is super yeah. rewarding, but also challenging at the same time and, and teaching on top of that. So that's probably the other thing too, the between parent and teacher finding that balance. It that, is. Yes. That is something. And I am saying all these things as though I, I'm an expert on it, but, you know, not being a parent, but I, I just try to put myself in the shoes of the student and how I felt right. growing up learning as well. So, yeah, so that's, a couple of good tips in there. Hopefully that was helpful. Absolutely. Yes. And, and whatever you can do to the environment. And I love the suggestion you made, you know, just 1%. I mean, we, we tend to have this, you know, all or nothing mentality, or if I don't change enough, it's just not going to happen. But those little things do matter. And, and so just to be, uh, just to observe and say, what, what little thing can we change maybe this week um, right. that may make things better? And then we'll just keep taking those steps forward. I so, um, yeah. My 1% uh, this year anyway is I, I've started to try to coordinate my days and weeks better. I've never used a physical <laughs> schedule before, so I'm really oh, putting wow. that into effect now. So I've always just written list, endless list, but it's um well my way that i explain it is like i call it vomiting in a box sounds terrible <laughs> it's a terrible concept but the way that my brain kind of works and a lot of parents might be like this too is we're kind of like a stream of consciousness kind of person hmm. like i've got to do this and then that led me to do this but that's right. letting my actions dictate my goals yeah. so yeah I so really i call does. that kind of like vomiting out things mm -hmm. but giving yourself boxes in which you're like, okay, I have dedicated an hour of my day for home organization. Whatever home organization thing sparks the thing to do it, I right. can do all those things. Um, and what you were just saying earlier, get a calendar out. Buy yeah. a calendar that's like you can print out or keep a digital calendar. And every day, just write the 1% thing that you did. Just, oh, yeah. Just yeah, one, just just one, one sentence. Absolutely. One sentence. I moved the table away from the TV area. Boom. Tick. You know, another yeah. day it's like, oh, 
uh, I he or she likes uh, to write different lessons in different colors. We got some colored pencils. Huh. Uh huh. Like yeah. And it's 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 those kinds of things that by the time that you get to the end of the year, or actually just do it for thirty days and see if it mm-hmm. becomes a habit. Right. And that's thirty steps closer to Absolutely. them being a better learner. So yeah, yeah something to yeah. do. Great encouragement. Love that. Yeah. So number seven. Utilize resources and collaborate. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah. not to do a pitch here, but look at homeschool courses um, and education resources that are crafted in that way or have some sort of learning right. principle in the way that they're trying to teach. Do they discuss their their teaching methodology or their pedagogy? on what Mm -hmm. they're learning um or uh is there some method to improvement here so you don't have to do that work of manually doing it sometimes there are programs music programs or singing programs or even math programs that are designed okay they've got revisionary questions they've got structures they've got Mm -hmm. different stimuli and examples and multifaceted things i don't have to make it up so when you're selecting courses and when you are going through content you in your mind if not physically write it down what is the profile of my student build yourself Uh, a profile so when you're looking at a curriculum and you're going to um the big uh homeschool events or conventions you're like trying to pick out books for curriculum look at the curriculum and say oh if you're it's between math a and math b this one has a better teaching and, and that I can apply the way that I like to teach and the way that yes. I like to teach. Yes. Yeah. I think too often when we we go and do that, uh, parents will look at it from their child's perspective. And I have always taken the opposite because I learned very early on, I bought some curriculum and I opened the box and I'm like, no. And I shut it. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bad idea. <laughs> because it, it, was, it was touted for everything my child needed, but everything I could not do. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, so, and that's a big thing, yeah. you know. It, it's huge. Uh, yes. You've got to be able knowing to knowing your limitations too. Yes. Like knowing mm-hmm. how you teach and what areas you need help in. Like all aug- you augment that with resources, but also collaborate. Find somebody else, right. find a group. You may find other parents. Like when you're assessing a co-op, do you have a look at, hey, the other parents in the group, what right. are their strengths? Exactly. And how do we balance and where can I help them and where can they help me? And yes. um, the biggest challenge is writing it down. They say, I think it's like in the 40s, 40 something percent of goals that are written down have a greater achievement. So uh, all these things that we're talking about, don't just try to think and think on the fly. Um, right. You know, Absolutely. at most, each of us, if you don't have ADHD, can remember about seven things. If you have ADHD, you can remember three things. So, okay. <laughs> you know, create create a list of things that I this year that you want to do, be a more effective homeschool teacher um, and, yeah. and do these criteria, build a profile, look at a profile of yourself. What are my teaching strengths? Where am our points of con- points of conflict with our kids and our students? Yes. And then what about our co-ops that we're in? Where are the strengths? What, mm-hmm. what do they get from there and how can I provide it? Like we have such an opportunity as homeschooling parents to really make education and learning and just learning to grow as a person um, so much further and so much more catered to our children. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. But, but it does take some planning and some goals and, um, and Mm -hmm. little by little, and it doesn't mean you have to be the most organized person or somebody that's always on top of your game. Um, that just doesn't happen when you've got multiple kids (laughs) learning all at different levels, but, um, but yes, it's, it's just being mindful, mindful in that direction that this is, this is the goal and, and you get better and better at it. I mean, I homeschooled for 19 years and, Mm um, (laughs) I just started out a mess and (laughs) eventually learned enough to get my kids through. Um, but, but yeah, it's just, it's a lot of grace on yourself, but, but yet. And a hundred percent. It's, it's, you learn. I think the big thing though, is set a baseline for yourself. Don't over like, this is how I currently teach. And Mm -hmm. ask yourself what your big goal is. Like, I want to improve my teaching. These are areas that I can improve. 
and then right. just do the 1% thing again. How yeah. can I improve that one thing by 1%? But if we don't document how we're teaching and how our kids are learning, we don't yeah. know where we are. Exactly. So and you down. don't know how far you've come no, either. And, no, and then you go, did I, did we fail this year? And I, I find people that write down, we did have one question from a viewer and this, this fits really good right in here. Yeah. Um, she had asked about, you know, customizing curriculum and planning and then using an IEP. Um, and, and I think this is where that comes in is, um, we have a free IEP download on our website and a lot of parents say, well, why would I do add that extra paperwork to myself. And I say, cause you're going to look at the, the, what you write about your child in one year, and you're going to mm -hmm. get to the end of the year and go, did we really learn anything? Did they make any progress? And when you go back and read that summary, you realize, wow, we did make progress. But if you don't keep track of those things and write them down, you lose track of how much is actually happening because we, we focus so much on the tiny little things that aren't working well and we forget just how far we have come and how far our 100%. kids have come. 100%. The other big thing and why I, this is a really great uh, diary that I got, it has not just my day schedule, but my goals for the day. <laughs> It's oh, yeah. Really, really great plan. That's uh -huh. by a yeah. company called My Goals, actually out of Australia. But it has on here top five things I want to do today. Um, it has daily habits I want to do, what I'm focused on today, and then breaking the day down. Um, yeah. I'm just going to mention a couple things, and um, everyone should look it up things like an Eisenhower matrix. So hmm. it breaks it into four quadrants important, but important and urgent, oh, yes. important, but not urgent. Mm -hmm. And having little graphs like that for a day of the tasks yeah. and assigning them to sections. The other thing that they say, uh, one of the good strategies is like the 333, which is like three hours for a project, three hours for communication, and three hours for completing tasks. So if mm. you want to give yourself a three hour block where you're working on a, a project, three hours that you can work through a task list and three hours that you can communicate, it helps you to structure your day. So this is for parents who maybe need a little bit more help with structuring. Yeah. And don't, and big thing is don't make it hard on yourself. Uh, one right. of the things in yeah. that Atomic Habits book, which I'm plugging a lot, but <laughs> one, the example talks about a runner. There's a runner who wakes up every morning to run with his buddies at like five or six in the morning. And the way that he achieves that is he puts his phone and clock, alarm clock on the other side of the room with <laughs> the clothes he packed the night before with the shoes and the clothes and that way, when he gets right. up to turn off the alarm, the resistance to putting on the clothes is right. not that hard. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that the book talks about is the first time you go for a run, run to the end of the block and back and you're done. Right. And it's about creating low hanging fruit. If your first mm. task was just to put the clothes on and then go back to sleep, do it. If you do that for a week, <laughs> The next one is like, oh, I might go outside and walk to the next house and back. So the same yeah. thing applies with what we're doing here. Let our small actions dictate to us to, no, let our large goals through small actions yeah. dictate where we're going and not letting our actions dictate our goals. Yeah. So if your phone yeah. is by the side of your bed, you're allowing the action and ease hmm. of reaching for that phone to dictate, I'm going to stay up all late doom scrolling through Instagram or whatever yeah. it is. Right. Uh, yeah. Great. Yeah. And, uh, and also I love this, I, the thing that you have in here is community, you know, really yes. surrounding yourself with other people who are supporting you in those goals or who can compliment you in areas where you're not as gifted. Um, that, that is just crucially important. We, we try to do so many things on our own. You've got to surround yourself with other people. Right. And, and at I that point again, point that out. Yeah. Make, accountability external yes yeah yeah do not allow yourself to give yourself permission i mean hey you're allowed to give yourself forgiveness we all make mistakes we're imperfect that's not what i'm saying but giving yourself permission to not try to do the right thing oh, just yeah. removing those barriers from those things like if you've mm -hmm. scheduled a meeting to meet with other parents regularly on friday and we're each going to bring a teaching component do it Yep. schedule it they're going to hold you accountable you're going to hold them accountable there's nothing worse than showing up and being i have nothing to add you know right. so it's it's yep. just that thought of just what can we do 
outside of our internal mind and choices to push something forward. Absolutely. So number eight, integrate tech. Great. We purpose. talked a ton about that already too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Little timer clocks, Pomodoro right. clocks are great. These little things are physical novelty things. You, we talked about Roblox. Find mm -hmm. technology that will help you move things yeah. along. Um, Absolutely. Again, everything has to be through the lens of back at point one. Understand yourself and the learner as well. And yeah. always look through those lenses. Do I join this co-op? Do I buy this little clock? Do we need colored pencils? Mm -hmm. So that your decisions are informed decisions and not impulsive, like, oh, yeah, oh, I think yeah, we can get that. Yeah, exactly. Like, you, yeah, like you're scrolling through Instagram and somebody's like, this is the greatest thing. It changed our homeschool. It's like, but it might not change yours. You know, you just, and you have to be just very discerning about, you know, all Beware those, magic those pills. Things. There is, yes, yes. Exactly. There, there are no magic pills to education and something that is a lifelong journey. Um, it's a commitment uh, to do. And if we want to do things right, mm -hmm. it's just going to take the elbow grease. Absolutely. But yeah. if there are tools that make it easier, great. So little things like this little clock, um, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. And I found that my as my kids got older, I would have them search like for an app, like a mind mapping app. My, my daughter mm -hmm. decided she wanted to write some curriculum and I said, okay, well, what is going to help you? And so she downloaded, I don't know how many apps before she found one that actually worked. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, th for them to learn how to, you know, evaluate those tools too, as they get older and they've used some, it's the, that's a life skill. That's a hundred percent. Well, yeah. It's, it's learning to ask. All right. Why. So yeah. number nine, nine, don't do it don't alone. Do it alone. Yep, we talked about that. Um, right. Again, um, communities, parents, teachers, programming, um, and, and, and people as wonderful as you, Peggy, like committed to doing this, having these conversations, use resources. Anyone listening to this Absolutely. podcast, you're already, you're already steps ahead. You are constantly yeah. getting inspired or ideas and having conversations and strategies and different perspectives on learning. The more yeah. diverse you are, the more you can apply your experience to, to that. Right. Absolutely. Yes. That's so true. Yes. We, we can't sit in a, a our own little space and expect to grow. We, you right. have to be challenged in, in everything that we do, not just our 100%. kids, but us as well. Yeah. All right. Number 10, rinse and repeat. <laughs> yep. This is, and that's it. Like, I mean, the nine steps before this one, look at your processes. How yeah. is my, how can I 1% what I'm doing here after yeah, each lesson? That's self-evaluation. Mm -hmm. But not just that, get feedback from your child. Mm. Yeah. Hey, how was that? Was that fun? Was today's lesson fun? Uh, this part was kind of boring. I didn't like that. Ah, oh, but mine oh, yeah. wasn't boring. Oh, mm -hmm. okay, cool. And if we can just, and at times it's going to be difficult, but, you right. know, and we have to push through a lesson, but if we can make it easier for them to absorb the specific lesson, why, why right. wouldn't we? So, right. Absolutely. So yeah. those are the 10 steps. Um, and again, with the handout, we've got a sample lesson plan from um, the vocal gym as well on how your voice works. And that's broken down into these kinds of sections and we try to divide it up as well. But, and the math lesson will attach too. Um, yeah. Peggy, yeah, if, we'll if get, I remember, I'll, I'll share I'll all those the links, links on, yeah, I'll share all the links to things that Andrew talked about and um, in the show notes on YouTube, as well as with the podcast. So you can look at um, those two places. Um, I'll also put it up on to um, uh, Facebook eventually. Um, but but yeah, those that's great. So then you're not looking for URLs. But I would like you to talk about um, Throga uh, a little bit and oh, just sure. your website and what people can find there. Because I, I actually did a review for Andrew. Um, and um, oh, yeah, so just the, on the the program itself. I was just amazed at how well it was designed. And, um, and I know, Andrew, you were behind a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know you had a conversation with uh, Richard about that in a podcast previously, but yes, he did um, a webinar with me too. So yes, yeah, there's a lot yes, of good so content from you guys. <laughs> I love, I love Richard. We are polar opposites as, <laughs> as human beings. Richard is very structured, very scientific, very organized. 
and I have ADHD, but I'm also like, oh yeah, free flowing uh -huh. information. But however, <laughs> the, the, the big thing here, and I wonder if I can share the screen. You should be able to go down and present plan. and do a, do a I, screen share. Can, yeah, let's see if that works. If I can get this to work. Share screen, how your voice works. Great, cool. So uh, at the Vocal Gym, uh, well, Throga is the, is the overall brand company, but the Vocal Gym was a course we designed because we saw it was missing so much in the homeschool environment. So many kids wanted yeah. to learn how to sing. Um, but one of the big challenges, and I had this going through school, was like learning how the instrument actually works. A lot of times yes. concepts with singing are like, imagine there's a string and it's oh, yeah, at exactly. the top of your head or <laughs> sing forward. But what does that mean? And it's so right. frustrating that you have to do these abstracts and convert them to what does it actually mean? Whereas mm -hmm. piano or guitar, you just put your finger here. This is the form for your hand. But Correct. if I go through this, this is the lesson that I was talking about earlier about how your voice works. A lot of the parts that I had learned over time, particularly when it comes to my learning differences, is I need as much stimuli to mm. absorb the information as possible. So, right. or if a lesson is too dragging or it takes too long, I need the information in quick points. I already understand the concepts. I just need quick information. Right. Or I need to read more in depth or I need a picture to explain it, or I need an activity to follow it up. These are all the things that, um, as we're going through and talking to Richard, hey, Richard, like we can implement these learning techniques that education has been using so effectively for so mm. long and take the burden off parents. So it's a comprehensive course that breaks down learning how to sing in... Uh, in a very straightforward and structured way, but also using science, not only learning yes. how to sing, you're learning how it. Yeah, I think you could works. replace a, a science credit um, for the amount of content that you have in that program. And the as fine well, arts credit as well. As a fine arts credit. Yes, exactly. That's um, It's quite amazing. And then you have extra projects that students can work on. I, yeah, I just have to throw out We're, some good words for you guys because it is yeah, amazing. We, We're so proud of it. Like it's been... Uh, the entire time of the pandemic, we started developing specifically a homeschool curriculum, hmm. really looking at the home environment, looking at how kids, um, you know, from middle school upward, it is a little bit young for elementary, but for middle right. school upwards, how they could take some of those principles and learning. It. And it's definitely a scientific course, um, mm -hmm. but it's also helping you understand yourself and your voice and just how much the voice I, I know some we ha we don't have any problems talking sometimes, but uh, being asked to sing in front of others, how vulnerable our singing voice is, and how core it is to who we are, and developing that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I when I started working with Richard, it was such a joy. It was hard, <laughs> but it was it was such a joy to really help with that. Yeah, well, that's awesome, and that that website is Throga. It's T H R O G A dot com, and I will again have that link in the show notes for you. Well, Richard or Andrew, sorry, oh, <laughs> you're yeah, talking yeah. so much about Richard. I know. Um, <laughs> but Andrew, thank you so so much. This has been an amazing conversation. Such good information. I'm super excited to share this with our audience who hasn't listened yet. I know a lot of people always watch afterwards. Um, we haven't had any comments or questions come in while we've been live, but mm -hmm. um, but I'm sure that um, this will just be a blessing to many um, as they they take the time to download the podcast or, um, or watch the show. So I appreciate you and just the time and, um, just for what you're doing and, um, and how you're continuing to grow yourself so you can help others. Um, thanks. Peggy. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. So later this week, we have another broadcast, um, actually in two days, I'm going to be interviewing Steve Demi, um, who is the creator of uh, Matthew C and the founder of Building Faith Families and also the um, co-chair of SPED Homeschool. Um, but he is going to be sharing um, a new perspective with us, something he hasn't actually ever spoke on. Um, his son, Johnny, who has Down syndrome, is now in his 30s, and he is finding how much 
his son has been a blessing to people around him and just how surprising that is to him as a dad who really struggled when his son was born um, and having a disability to what his son has turned into and in the influence he's made in his own life. So Steve's going to be talking about that with us um, on Thursday. So you're going to um, want to join us for that conversation as well. Um, and, and so, um, so definitely come back and, um, join us again on, on our show, but, um, we appreciate you, Andrew, and I'm sure this will not be the last time you'll be on, um, you Happy have to so, come back. so many good things to say, and I'm excited to, to see, um, all the pursuits that you guys have, um, that you're working on. So to definitely check out throga.com and, um, and then check back, um, for the show notes and, um, the links that, that we have on there. So, um, so I appreciate your time again, Andrew. Thanks again. Thanks you. Thank you all for watching. Um, especially our new audience there on, on Instagram and we'll make sure that we, um, we keep our, our weekly shows going there as well. So, have a great week, everybody. God bless. And we'll, we'll see you next time. Bye. This is Empowering Homeschool Conversations, provided by Sped Homeschool. Go to spedhomeschool.com to get resources and support for teaching.